What is a Watchman device? So Watchman is a device that we use in conjunction with somebody having a problem with atrial fibrillation to try to reduce their risk of clots and strokes not being on a blood thinner. So remember, atrial fibrillation is a common abnormal heart rhythm where your heart actually develops abnormal sources of electricity in other walls of the heart that actually have the ability to wake up on their own, they have a mind of their own, and then they can override and take over control of your heart away from your normal source. And our heart is just a big muscle. It runs on electricity. It only beats when it gets an electrical signal. So we are all born with a normal source of electricity in the roof of our heart that sends out electrical impulses controlling our heart and our brain controls that. But we can develop other sources of electricity that we call abnormal heart rhythms. And when these abnormal rhythms randomly wake up because they have a mind of their own, they can override your normal rhythm, take over control, make your heart speed up, and then they can go back to sleep. And then when they go back to sleep, your normal rhythm takes back over control, but the abnormal rhythm is still there. It's just sleeping and it can wake up again and cause more problems. Now with the most common abnormal heart rhythm out of the 15 known abnormal heart rhythms is atrial fibrillation. And atrial fibrillation, thankfully, is not a directly dangerous rhythm, meaning when it wakes up and takes over control of your heart, it can make your heart speed up, but thankfully it's never gonna make your heart speed up to a life-threatening speed where your heart is beating at speeds of 200, 300, or even up to 400 beats per minute, the way some dangerous rhythms can make your heart do, which would make you pass out and die. No, AFib makes your heart go at exercise speeds where your heart's racing like you're exercising, and it can be very symptomatic, but it's not directly dangerous or life-threatening. But the one problem with atrial fibrillation that is potentially dangerous or life-threatening is unfortunately, atrial fibrillation can also lead to a stroke. And the standard way of having a stroke is that you just live long enough to form cholesterol blockages in your brain vessels directly that cut off blood supply to your brain and cause damage in a stroke. And that has nothing to do with atrial fibrillation. That has to do with you getting older and having a bad diet, high cholesterol diet, diabetes, high blood pressure, smoking, blah, blah, blah. Just like people can have cholesterol blockages form in their heart vessels that lead to heart disease and heart attacks. And that has nothing to do with atrial fibrillation. That has to do with getting older, having a bad diet, high cholesterol, smoking, diabetes, blah, blah, blah. But atrial fibrillation can cause a stroke a secondary way, which is every time it wakes up, it can take over control of your heart, speed it up, but also every time it takes over control of your heart, whether it makes your heart go fast enough to feel it, or it's not that fast and you don't even feel it, it doesn't matter. Anytime the atrial fibrillation wakes up, there is a small risk of clots and strokes. If you form a blood clot, not a cholesterol blockage, but a blood clot in your heart, in that left upper chamber of your heart, the left atrium, you won't feel it, but the clot could then break loose, float out of your heart, float up to your brain and cause a stroke. Now the standard treatment for this is a blood thinner. Depending on your age and comorbid medical problems, there is somewhere between a three to 5% risk on average of a clot and a stroke. Although sometimes it could be as low as 2% or as high as eight to 10% depending on your age and comorbid medical problems. But being on a blood thinner has been proven to reduce your risk to less than 1%. And we definitely have some newer agents that work simply. You just take them and then they work. Unlike the old agent that we used up until probably about uh, late 2000s, 2010, 2012-ish. Up until that point, we used a medication called warfarin or Coumadin, which is the so-called rat poison. That's the drug that inhibits clotting factors in your body by making your liver not form certain kinds of clotting factors. And so it thins your blood but it also was difficult to take because it could be affected by diet, it could be affected by your other medications, and you always had to do blood tests and always check it and see where you're at. But the newer drugs, they just work. You don't have to worry about them being affected by diet. You don't have to be worried about it affected by your other medications. You don't have to keep getting blood work to check your levels and adjusting the dose. It just works. And they've been proven to make your risk for clots and strokes with atrial fibrillation less than 1%. But not everybody can tolerate being on a blood thinner. There's many people who just don't tolerate it. There are people who've had severe bleeds on blood thinners. They've had uh, stomach ulcers or various other malformations in their gastrointestinal tract that cause bleeding. They've had cancers that bleed. There are people who are older, 80s and 90s, where they're very unsteady and they fall down a lot and they hit their head a lot and you do not want to be hitting your head on a powerful blood thinner because if you bleed into your head and you don't stop bleeding because of the blood thinner, you could die. So 
up until say 2016 when the Watchman device was FDA approved, we had to make some tough choices. So I remember coming out of training over 20 years ago in the early 2000s and back then it used to be, hey, put somebody on a blood thinner because they have a 3% or 5% or 8% risk of clots and strokes with AFib and having seen some severe disastrous strokes you're like no we want to protect this person a lot of people feel like having a stroke is worse than death because if you can't talk or you can't move it's just horrible so we wanted to protect people but we also saw that some people had massive bleeding issues or fell down and hit their head a lot and they could not safely be in a blood thinner so in the old days we had to just sort of pick your poison we had to say okay what do we think this person's risk of clots and strokes is from their atrial fibrillation oh five percent what do we think this person's risk of having a dangerous bleed, because they've already had several dangerous bleeds, on, on the blood thinner? Oh, 9%. Well, guess what? Then we're going to not have you on the blood thinner because your risk for bleeding is higher than your risk for strokes. Or we think this person's risk for stroke is, say, 7%. And we think this person's risk of falling down and hitting their head and bleeding into their head and dying is 3%. Well, I guess you just gotta be careful and we're gonna put you on the blood thinner and try to be as careful as possible. We literally had to do that. But then in 2016, they came out with the Watchman device. It had been studied since the early 2000s, but it was FDA approved in 2016. So what's the basis of the Watchman? The basis of the Watchman is the fact that studies have shown that when clots form in the left upper chamber of your heart, the walls where AFib cells form and where AFib sources are created and then control your heart from there, when you're in AFib, the clots form in that chamber, but they don't form evenly throughout the chamber. In fact, we found that 90 to 92% of them form in a little pouch-like structure on the lateral wall of that chamber. So if you think of that chamber as like a room where there's a back wall called the posterior wall, front wall called the anterior wall, roof, floor, and then two side walls. One of the side walls is called the lateral wall, and then the side wall that's opposite the right upper chamber of the heart is called the septum. Well, on the lateral wall, there's actually a little pouch-like structure, looks like a little pouch, called the left atrial appendage. And it doesn't really serve much purpose, it's just a little pouch-like area, but unfortunately, that's where most of the clots form. And I get it, because it's not, it's just a little pouch-like structure when the atria contracts, it doesn't contract as well in that pouch area so there's some stasis of blood flow and it's easier for clots to form that makes sense but 90 to 92 percent of clots tend to form in there not 100 percent, but a good 90 percent so what if we were to close that pouch and there's different ways you have of doing that the watchman closes it because it's a little umbrella like device that you just deploy at the opening of that appendage uh, structure and it just kind of closes it off almost like you say i want to get rid of this closet, I hate this closet, so I'm gonna close the door, lock it, paint over it, and just pretend it's not there. You just seal the opening of that area. That's all we're doing. We're just sealing the opening of that appendage to with this little device, and then it grows into place, and actually tissue grows over it to just kind of make it part of the wall, and then that structure is blocked off from the rest of the left atrium. So any clots that form in it, they cannot get out to go to your brain and cause a clot in a stroke just like surgically, you can close it. There's ways of putting a little clip on, so you can clip it at its neck and just kind of clip it. That also would keep it from becoming a source of clots and strokes, and also has the advantage that when you clip it off, the structure kind of atrophies and dies because of lack of blood flow, and electrically, it stops becoming a source of atrial fibrillation, because it is a well-known source of atrial fibrillation, especially in the later stages of persistent and long-standing persistent, not so much in the earlier paroxysmal atrial fibrillation stage. So you get some added benefit of doing that, but that's surgery uh, where somebody either has to do it while they're doing open heart surgery for some other reason, um, or somebody does a standalone and make a hole to your heart and they close it. But we can do that from the inside a lot easier in terms of recuperation wise. It doesn't electrically make it not a source of atrial fibrillation uh, cells or sources, but it can close it off so you're at less risk for clots and strokes. So we can do that, and then it grows into place, and then you have to be on a powerful blood thinner maybe for six weeks or so until it kind of grows into place, and then if it is well seated and in a good position, then you could not have to be on a powerful blood thinner from that point forward. But the question becomes, does this protect you as well as a standardized 
blood thinner? Well, the jury's still out on that. I think the answer currently here in 2024 would still be probably no. The edge would still be given to the blood thinner. We have mountains and mountains of evidence that show that blood thinners, whether it be the early warfarin or coumadin, to these newer drugs, do reduce your risk significantly to probably less than 1%. Not zero, but close, less than 1%. The studies for closing the appendage, like the Watchmen, it's it's not, it doesn't have as much evidence behind it. Certainly in 2016, when this first came out, there was not enough evidence to say that it was definitely comparable or superior to a blood thinner. That's why I remember back in 2016, when this first came out, Medicare, which is the largest insurer of medical procedures and medical care in the United States, because most people are over age 65 who need a lot of health care, Medicare actually had very strict guidelines as to when they would reimburse us for doing this because they were worried that less scrupulous doctors in my field would start putting them in to everybody and tell people, hey, as long as you have this done, you don't need to be on that blood thinner, which is costly and annoying. And you know, and this, this is just as good. And the data didn't really support that at that time. And so they actually required us initially to not only do this as a team, but also they required it to be documented that there's a good reason why this person who has atrial fibrillation is not able to really safely be on blood thinners, whether that reason is that they fall down a lot and they're a high risk of hitting their head and bleeding, or they've had major bleeds in the past, or they are in a profession or some area where they cut themselves a lot and, and, and it's just unsafe, or they're just somebody who just flat out refuses or can't afford the, the blood thinner and this is better than not being on the blood thinner, uh, or just better than not being on anything. So there's usually got to be a good reason, and we were supposed to document that, and two people had to document it. One person not involved with the procedure who wasn't going to make any money from the procedure, which is usually the primary care doctor, and then somebody involved with the procedure. And both had to be documented for Medicare to actually reimburse us. Now, that was 2016. Now, fast forward here, eight years later, they've relaxed that quite a bit. They don't really check or audit, and so most people are putting in the Watchman implant now, is, are doing it by themselves. They're not necessarily doing it in a team anymore. And people aren't really having it documented twice. I think that's partly because it's now been out for a while. And so they've just kind of relaxed their standard, but also because there have been some more recent trials, smaller trials that have suggested that protection with the Watchmen is comparable to the blood thinner. But when you actually look at the consensus statement of how we're supposed to practice based on the research, the feeling is, or the standard of practice still says that because there's so much more evidence to suggest that the blood thinner is definitely going to protect you optimally and a lot less evidence for these closure devices that they would still recommend that you put the person on the blood thinner to protect the person from clots and strokes with their atrial fibrillation and only consider a left atrial appendage closure device if there's a good reason why they can't be on the blood thinner. It still shouldn't necessarily be, oh, just do this so that you don't have to be on the blood thinner and people just kind of make money, which fortunately some of that does happen. Um, because if that's the case, then the millions upon millions of people in the world, well, then why put anybody on a blood thinner? Just put the left atrial appendage closure device, either surgically or implant from the inside, which doesn't even take that long, and then get everybody off the blood thinner. But I think the data, we still need more data. There's some promising studies that suggest that they could be comparable, but they're still the body of evidence still supports blood thinners and me personally i have seen cases where clots have formed an afib outside of the appendage i had a recent procedure where i was doing an atrial fibrillation ablation on a patient and he was in afib pretty much virtually 100 percent of the time it was going a case that was going to require a more advanced ablation try to get him back to normal rhythm not just a simple one wall the corners pulmonary vein isolation where those veins insert into the back wall that was going to require more. And as we were setting up for the procedure and got access to the patient, we looked at his heart under ultrasound and we saw a clot flipping around in the left atrium. And it was not coming from the appendage. It was actually attached to the septum and it was long and flipping around. And so this patient, I knew that when I talked to his cardiologist, he's like, well, you know, he's not the most reliable. I'm not sure he's been taking his blood thinner religiously or appropriately. And so I canceled the procedure because I didn't want to knock the clot loose and have him wake up with a devastating stroke. And I 
put him back on his blood thinner and I kind of put the fear of God into him a little bit and said, look, you, you really need to be on your blood thinner. We cannot safely do this procedure if you have any clots in there. And he took it religiously for four weeks, four to five weeks. And then we repeated an ultrasound and the clot was gone. And there was slow flow in that chamber. And I can see how clots form very easily because he's always in AFib, but the clot was dissolved by the blood thinner. And had this patient just had a watchman or a left atrial appendage clip or some other way, and there's that amulet device that also closes it, uh, similar to a watchman, um, different devices. But if they just had that, they still could have had a stroke. They probably would have had a stroke because not all clots form in the left atrial appendage. Over 90% do, but not 100%. And in this situation, the blood thinner was able to dissolve the clot safely so that I could do the procedure and then afterwards keep him on the blood thinner to protect him. So I'd like to see more data on this, but as of 2024, the recommendations are that if you're at high risk for clots and strokes with your atrial fibrillation, that you be placed on a blood thinner. And then if you have a good reason not to be in the blood thinner, or you're just not going to be on it, you refuse or you just can't afford the medication, that we consider a left atrial appendage closure device, but that isn't yet felt to be the first line therapy where we just go to it so that you don't have to be on a blood thinner. And if somebody's telling they're referring docs or patients that, well, just come to me, I'll close this up, and then you're just as protected as the blood thinner. I'm not sure that the data quite supports that, even though there's some promising trials that are suggesting they could be comparable or equivalent. I think more data is needed. I've personally had stories, like I told you, I've seen clots form outside of the left atrial appendage, so I'm still a little bit hesitant. And I think that most doctors in my field still would put the person on a blood thinner. So just be a little bit careful that if somebody tells you, hey, just to have this procedure done so that you don't have to be on it and tries to tell you that it's perfectly equivalent. I think you should ask a little bit more questions or do a little bit more research because I don't think we're quite there yet. And you have to be always careful that the person's not just doing it so that they can get more procedures and make more money.